So we use the analogy of a five-story building, uh, and that's the uh, the decoder. So the transformer has two parts. It's got the encoder, which is uh, on the left, and it's got a decoder, which is on the right, like for visualization purposes. Just imagine left right. and right. So we talked. Does, yeah, go ahead. It doesn't actually, I mean, to like clarify there, there's not like literally a left and yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Like that doesn't, it's really just on the it's picture. Just different functions, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, on the picture in that paper. And so, therefore, what a lot of people will use when they are representing it. Although, also, I think I might, because we often think like, at least in the writing systems that we use in the West, they go from left to yeah. right. And so from that perspective, maybe it also makes a little bit of sense because if you think about an encoder and a decoder together, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's easier to kind of conceptualize. And that's probably how you're going to run through it, like the encoder working before the decoder. The, so kind of information think, moving left to right. I think that stems from the sec to sec models. Remember the RNN or LSTM based models, and they were pictured as uh, like a sequence of boxes going like from left to right, like a train, as in the words that you're, as you said, we write from left to right. That's how the words uh, stem that's encoder was on the left. It was like a flat horizontal structure, and then feeding into uh, the and decoder on the right, or another flat horizontal structure. Whereas with the transformer, um, now the structures like are vertical. Hence our analogy of buildings. Uh, but yeah, they kept the positioning, I guess. So uh, we talked previously. We talked about the part on the right, which is the decoder, and we discussed that it has five levels. Uh, so we're going to recap that, and then we will see what happens when we add the part on the left, which is the encoder. So decoder, if we start from the bottom, the very bottom level, if you imagine a five-story building, um, and you're inputting words into this, like you're inputting your prompt into a large language model. You're asking it, what is the tallest mountain, question mark? You put that in. So it all goes into this first level of the building, and key thing is transformers process input, not sequentially, but in parallel. So all those words go in at the same time. And the first level, each of those words gets a uh, input embedding. So an input embedding is a vector. Effectively, um, we what we can't, you know, like a, a large language model is neural networks, and neural networks can't work with words; they need to work with numbers. So we're representing each word with a vector, and these are not just random vectors; they are vectors that have semantic meaning. Semantic meaning is dictionary meaning of the word. So words that have similar semantic meaning are going to be similar. Words that have different semantic meaning are going to be far away from each other. So for example, an orange is going to be closer to an apple and a banana than it's going to be to the word car or airplane or the, or the verb uh, to run or the adjective beautiful. So all words will get some encoding. And all of these vectors, they are 512 dimensional because the more dimensions you have, the better you can describe a word. Um, so yeah, that's effectively level one. Right? Anything to add? All good? Just quick recap. No, all good, man. Yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> you, you got this down. Yeah. <laughs> okay, level two. So now we've converted our words into vectors. And there's many ways of doing this. There's a bag of words model. There's the n-gram model and so on. So, you know, like you can you can read read up about those. That's not the core of this uh, transformer or large language model. It's just like a, a method that we have to do. Then um, uh, after that, level two is the next module, which is called the positional encoding module. Now, as mentioned before, uh, all of these words, like what is the tallest mountain question mark, uh, they go in at the same time. By the way, quick caveat, we, as in the previous podcast, we're talking about words, but actually it's, uh, they get broken down into um, what are tokens, and uh, tokens you know, are a bit smaller than words. Uh, we're not going to go into detail that, so we're going to use tokens and words interchangeably in this podcast. So tokens go into level one, they get these vectors, then they go up to level two. And in level two, oh, you want to say something, John? Well, I should just really quickly say that usually they're smaller than words because tokens could be, you, uh, you could have word level tokens, you could have character level tokens. What's on Vogue today, and which we talked about a lot more in the preceding episode, is subword tokens, which will typically be like, uh, yeah, parts of a word. So if you have a very long word, it gets broken up into several of these subwords. If you have a short word, it might it might be the same. So yeah, so generally speaking, yeah, exactly, exactly. And I, I don't mean to like nitpick. No, 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 that's very useful. That, yeah, I, lo yeah, I love yeah. learning something new. I didn't know that tokens could be bigger than words. That, that, that's an yeah, I mean, because you can even, you could even have, theoretically, you could have like a sentence level token. You can, you could talk about like breaking up a document into like, like it's kind of like a definitional thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, cool. Very cool. Yeah, cool. yeah. 
Yeah. But yeah, subword tokens. Yeah. That's definitely the way tokens. things are done today. So again, uh, we have these words. They get broken down in tokens. We're going to forget about tokens, which is going to use words for now. They go into this level one. They get the ve their uh, individual vectors, which represent their dictionary or semantic meaning. Then from there, they go to level two. On level two, they get a positional encoding. What is a positional encoding? Well, as discussed, all of these words go in at the same time. Previous models, such as the uh, RNN based or recurrent neural network models, or even more specifically the LSTM uh, models, they would take in the input one word at a time. So they would inherently know the order in which the words came. Transformers are very efficient at training, at processing data, uh, because they can take input in parallel. So imagine like a whole a whole page or a hundred pages go in at the same time to transform. That's why when you ask ChatGPT a question, like you put in maybe um, a whole page of text, it instantly gives you the answer because it doesn't need to process every word by itself. It processes everything at the same time. But the drawback is that now it doesn't know in which order the words came. So we have to have this level two module where we add a positional encoding mechanism. So for example, we looked at the example uh, in the previous um, podcast where we said, the wait, what are they called? Horses eat apples. Uh, and then if you reorder the words and you get apples eat horses is grammatically correct, but it's completely different meaning. Yeah. Do you remember yeah. that while you, while you were talking about that, yeah. I, we haven't, I should, maybe I could share sure. them, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, for accessing in the show notes, but I wanted to see if, because it's so unusual to think about apples eating horses, yeah. it sounds like it is, it's grammatically nonsense. Yeah. Uh, but I wondered whether if I went into Dolly 3 yeah. in the ChatGPT interface and asked it to create apples eating horses, I thought that maybe it would be such grammatical nonsense, so far out of sample yeah. of the training data that it wouldn't be able to do it, but it did it perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> and, so, and then I sent in real time as we were recording the episode, I slacked yeah. uh, images made by Dolly 3 of apples eating horses. <laughs> so it, it is really amazing to me how the most modern LLMs that we have at the time of recording are able to, in many cases, and there are constraints where you try to go too far out of sample and it just, it won't be able to figure that out and create the sentence for you or create the image for you. But they're starting to get with these billions of parameters, they're starting to get unbelievably flexible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, such such that even this grammatical nonsense, no problem. For sure, that was really cool. I tried uh, creating a, an image, I think yesterday, of um, what was it? Uh, create ah, oh, it was something to do. Oh, how do, in uh, quantization a uh, normal distribution gets converted into a certain to quantized. Um, uh, yeah, what's it called? Quantized number type. For this is for quantization for neural networks. Came up with the craziest picture ever. <laughs> like it was, it was similar to your apples eating horses image. So yeah, but at least you gave it a shot. Yeah, it's uh, anyway. I, I derail you. You're, you're talking about horses eating apples as being like grammatically sensible, and apples eating horses as being like <laughs> nonsense. Not yeah, and so nonsense, nonsense. Basically, if you move the words around in a sentence, the change, the meaning changes. So we have to preserve positional. Uh, we have to know what position the words came in, and we have to communicate that to the transformer. And that's what module two does. There's lots of ways of doing that. Uh, there's a very elegant solution that's used in the transformer. Uh, it's uh, or in, in this decoder part that we're talking about, um, it's uh, it uses cosine and sine functions. We're not going to go into detail on that. Uh, it's another technical topic, but it's outside of the um, core value of what transformers bring to the table, which is attention, and that's the next level. So after these vectors, uh, after the yeah, after the words get the vectors, and the vectors get positional encoding added to them, they go into part three, which is the self attention mechanism. And the self-tension mechanism basically from each one of those vectors uh, creates a creates three vectors: the Q vector, the K vector, and the V vector. Uh, the query vector, the key vector, and the value vector. So uh, the query query vector is um, the vector that looks for something. Let, let's rewind a little bit. Let's say uh, why do we need this attention mechanism? Let's start there. So attention mechanism uh, allows us to add context to the words that we're using to, to encapsulate context. Uh, example that we used uh, previously was 
uh, the dog did not cross the street because it was too tired. So the word it refers to the words uh, to the to the dog because the dog was too tired. Uh, now, if we change the last word in the sentence, the dog didn't cross the street because it was too wide. The word it refers to the street because the street was too wide. So we can see that context of a sentence can change the meaning of individual words. And what that tells us is that words don't only have dictionary meaning, which is a semantic meaning, they also have contextual meaning. And the huge advancement of transformers uh, compared to other previous uh, models is that they are able to capture this context. Well, to be fair, there was a paper before the transformers where attention was introduced uh, by Dmitry Bagdanu uh, with uh, Yosho Benjo as his supervisor. And Yosho Benjo actually came up with the term attention. We were speaking about Yosho, really want to get him on the show, invite him onto the show. And uh, like we've mentioned him a couple of times, we're great to get him onto the show. Yeah, I think I think we're getting we're getting closer and closer. I think it might That'd happen That would be soon. awesome. So anyway, so the attention concept was introduced previously, but uh, Transformers really take advantage of it uh, in a beautiful way. And so, um, but what attention uh, does is it allows to capture that contextual meaning of words. And if you don't capture contextual meaning, if you just capture dictionary meaning, then we're back to like 2015 model, 2016 model, right? All that RNN, LSTM, LSTM models, they're pretty good, but they can't put together a, a long enough sentence because they lose that contextual uh, thread. And so this attention mechanism is designed to capture context as we saw it's important. Uh, how do they do it? Uh, every word gets three, instead of one with vector, which we had uh, already, it gets three vectors. From that one vector, we create three vectors. We get Q vector, Ka vector, and a V vector. And let's say, uh, let's say we're looking at the sentence, apples are a type of delicious blank. So uh, for every word, we're going to create a contextual vector. How do we do that? Well, for example, for the word delicious, we go and uh, take the, the Q vector of the word delicious, which will contain what the word delicious is looking for. Uh, then it will go and interact with every K vector of every other word, including itself. So it will say, okay, my this is my Q vector of the word delicious. What's the K vector of the word apples? What's the K vector of the word R? What's the K vector of the word A, uh, delicious, fruit, and so on? So it will uh, interact with each one. Interact is in like we will compare the Q vector to the K vector. That comparison is done through a dot product uh, operation. And if two vectors are aligned, their dot, dot product is high. If two ve vectors are perpendicular, it's zero. If they're not aligned, it's very low. Um, so we do that process, and through that process, we know which vectors QK pairs are aligned, which QK pairs are not aligned, and the ones that are aligned, that's where we go to that word and we take the V value from that word. So the Q vector is what I'm looking for is the word delicious. The K vector is what every other word, including myself, has to offer. And the V value is what it actually offers, what context it offers to other words. So uh, as the word delicious, I'm going to pick the words where my K vector is aligned, my, their K vector is aligned with my Q vector. And from those words, I will extract the V value. And mathematically, it's a simple weighted sum. And the weights are basically the softmax of the dot products of uh, the QK pair, uh, or the QK pairs. We won't go into too much detail on that. That's very like thoroughly uh, explained. Uh, we went uh, thoroughly through it in the, the previous episode, 747. Um, but I guess the, the main takeaway is that uh, these QKV vectors are created. Um, obviously, they're randomly initialized because the weights of the initial uh, neural network are random. But then over time, the transformer learns how to update the weights in such a way that it can take advantage of the mechanism. I think for me, the biggest breakthrough in understanding attention was that we're not telling it what to do. We're not telling it, oh, use the Q vector like this. You have to put this value, this information in the K vector. You have to put this information in the V vector. We're just creating this mechanism for it to be able to take advantage of it and then create, like populate the vectors in such a way that then it will, like over epochs and epochs of training, that it will like be able to attend to different words. So our job is to mathematically implement the mechanism. The transformer, through training, will learn to use it, and that's a key di distinction. That's why you know we love neural networks. That was very nicely said. Thank you. Okay, so once we're done with that tension, what we get on the output of this level three is that we have these context-enriched vectors. Now every word 
Uh, previously, it had just a semantic enriched vector, which had then which we added positional coding to. Now, from that, using that QKV mechanism, we will have uh, context-rich vectors. So each ve each word now knows the context of the sentence that it's in. Then all that goes through layer level four, which is a feed-forward neural network. Why that's important, uh, John very elegantly put it last time. It adds flexibility to the learning process uh, because uh, it, didn't, it it adds additional weights. And also, that's the only place in the whole architecture where we have an activation function. We haven't had any activation functions before prior to this. And then level five, these vectors go to level five where they go through a linear transformation to map them from the 512 dimensional space that they're in to the output space. And the output space in our case is uh, the whole, um, all of the words in the English language, which depending on how you count can be 200,000 or more. So we want to go from a 512 dimensional vector to a 200,000 dimensional vector. And then we apply a soft max to that vector uh, to get probabilities. So we get a probability distribution across all of the words of the English language, and that allows us to like select something. One very important key consideration, something to keep in mind that I, uh, like we talked about in the previous podcast, and I want to reiterate now, is that each one of the vectors, so let's say we have apples are a type of delicious blank, right? So six words, they all go through this process separately, right? So they go we, at the end, we all the whole way through, we have six vectors. Then each one of the six vectors gets converted into those three QKV vectors. Then again, we get six vectors, six context rich vectors. Then after the neural network, there's they go through a new uh, the feed forward neural network. They go separately. So we have six of them on the output. And then afterwards, through the linear transformation, again, we get six vectors, 200,000 uh, values each. So six vectors, each one is 200,000 dimensional. Then we get six probability distributions. Uh, each one with 200,000 values. And then we throw away the first five and we keep the last one. So the probability distribution that we extracted from the context rich vector of the word delicious, and we apply that to the all the words of the English language to predict what the next word is. That's very key consideration. They, these vectors don't get mixed. The only time they can get some information from each other is in that tension mechanism. Otherwise, they go through separately in parallel. And that's a very important part of the transformer architecture. Very cool. This is a little bit of a, a tangent, and I don't expect you to know the answer. I don't really know it either. But as you were talking about that final layer, how the fifth layer has that linear transform with the dictionary of, and and you say in the English language, and that assumes that this is like a single language yep. um, LLM. But of course, if we're using GPT-4 or Gemini or something like that, it can output Good in point. like hundreds of languages. So it's crazy to think how many uh tokens or how many words there must be in that dictionary. Yep. So one thing I was thinking about is, so what if we're not outputting words, mm -hmm. but what if this is like Dolly 3 and we're outputting pixels? Yep. I guess it would be, um, I guess the probability map would be um, some like pixel color, like the most good, probable color for a given location. Um, I don't know the answer to image uh, version of transformers, but I do know like, for example, in BERT, Right, you don't want to output a whole word, right? You just want to output a class, for example. Um, so you have that CLS token that gets added into the input at the beginning, and then the sentence goes through the BERT model, which we can talk about at the end. But basically, uh, effectively, what in the BERT model they have is they don't have the the mapping doesn't go to two hundred thousand vectors, but goes to your number of classes, which could be three classes, for example. You know, positive sentiment, neutral sentiment, negative sentiment. And that's it. So I guess in the image version, it would be somewhat similar. 